Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Pinecker, and look who the co-host with the mostest, or co oh, see, I used to say Rebecca, co-hostess with the mostest, but you're not a hostess, <laughs> co-host Robert Messick of Robert uh, Book of Mormon Editions on YouTube. Welcome back to the program. Either way, I am glad to be here. So thank you, Stephen, for having me. Well, and if, folks, you know, when I have Robert on as a co-host, it's because we're doing something Book of Mormon related. And we have this really interesting guest on who is, was somebody who was involved in this really interesting project of, of producing a modern English version of the Book of Mormon called the Covenant of Christ. And uh, it's actually a, a really good translation, I think, in my mind. It's very familiar to me. I'm actually going to kind of discuss maybe some of the the equivalent of some modern English uh, editions of the book of, of the Bible that it seems to be similar to that I've read growing up as well. So it was familiar to me, Paul. So Paul Durham, uh, who is one of the editors of this remarkable document, welcome to the program, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Is this uh, CNN? Uh, it's, I was... it's funny, you guys don't look like Anderson Cooper and Wolf Blitzer. <laughs> I thought this was going to be Peggy Fletcher Stack or Lindsay Hanson Park. <laughs> Am I on the right podcast? I Thanks don't get paid enough. Me. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. So um, I guess, Paul, I just I just want you to give a little background on this edition of the Book of Room and also give a little background on yourself. Look, let the audience a little, know a little bit about you and, and your faith background and then what ultimately um, led you into doing something like this. Oh, okay. Uh, Thanks. I, I probably won't have all the answers you're looking for, um, but I want you to know just on the outset, outset that uh, I'm speaking just for myself. I'm representing just myself, if that makes sense. Fair enough. Um, I can't speak for, for others. Um, but to, uh, to get to the point, I, I think this is the most exciting news of the restoration for a long, long time. Um, otherwise, you might have you know such news as the Tabernacle Choir on tour in Florida and in Georgia. New hymns released for the for the new hymn book. A new temple was dedicated by Elder Uchtdorf. Elder Cook spoke to the Supreme Court Justice in Korea recently. And President Nelson celebrated his 100th birthday. Uh, so I think this what this represents is uh, more exciting and uh, more significant. Uh, if we push, if we go to Mr. Peabody's uh, Wayback Machine, if you're familiar with that, um, let me explain some of my background and heritage with the church. Um, I was born and raised in the church. My great-grandfather, Thomas Durham, was an Englishman, and he came to Utah with the ill-fated Martin Handcart Company. His future wife, uh, my great-grandmother, was from Denmark, and she was on the ill-fated Willie Handcart Company. Uh, my great-grandfather, Morgan Richards, immigrated to the Utah Territory from Wales with many of the Western Overland Pioneer Companies, and he became the first state auditor for the state of Utah. Uh, my great-uncle was Alma Richards, the first Utah's, Utah's first Olympic um, gold medalist, who won the high jump in Stockholm in 1912. My grandfather, Alfred Durham, was a Juilliard, Juilliard trained musician and taught music first with the Church Academy in Iron County and then with the public schools in Utah. He's best known for his church service, public legislature service, and writing the popular hymns. Well, I'll name a couple. Uh, Carry On, They the Builders of the Nation, and again, our dear redeeming Lord. Uh, my mother, Marion Hassel Durham, was born and raised in the state of Georgia, Brooks County, Southern Georgia. Um, she's a third generation Mormon. Her father passed the uh, Georgia State Bar at the youngest age at the time and eventually became postmaster of, of their city. Uh, she was every bit my father's equal or superior in intelligence and in looks. Uh, she was a voracious reader and her favorite book was the Book of Mormon. 
My father, Richard Durham, taught for the church as a seminary and institute teacher for 27 years. Uh, he was encouraged to enter the teaching profession by then counselor in the first presidency and neighbor, David O. McKay. He was a prodigious chess player and champion, having been the state of Utah champion half a dozen times and Western States champion at age 19. He even tied the uh, then uh, former U.S. champion Samuel Lyshevsky, who, by the way, was unseated by the great 14-year-old Bobby Fischer. Mm. My dad met my mother while serving an LDS mission in the southern states. After his mission, she traveled the continent by train to Utah, and President McKay opened an otherwise closed temple on Christmas Eve so they could be married. My dad was a scholar and could read and write a dozen languages. Hugh Nibley wrote of him that knowing him as a student and colleague, he didn't hesitate to say that he is He's the ablest Utah scholar he had ever known. His all around competence was astonishing. In language classes, he displayed unique powers of discernment, which seemed to me to be almost uncanny, he wrote. That is to say, he possessed gifts which no amount of study can impart. My dad was a firm believer in the Book of Mormon, taught that it is God's revelation for our time, and he believed that Joseph Smith was a full time prophet not a part-time one. Uh, and that brings us to an interesting story. It deals with the period of time when the church showed a great neglect for the Book of Mormon. Uh, my dad was told by a CES administrator, one of his bosses, who became commissioner of education, university president, and a future general authority. He told him that my dad was unqualified to teach at the university level because he believed in the Book of Mormon if you can believe that. It really parallels Nibley's uh, experience where he was told by a colleague at BYU, Richard Paul, who happened to be in our ward, the uh, Oak Hills second in Provo. Um, he was Nibley was told that since he believed the Book of Mormon, he wasn't qualified to teach history. While, while he claimed to know the truth, the professors in the history department claimed only to be searching for truth. A little about me, I'll make this brief. I have five brothers and one sister. All but two of us served LDS missions, one to the Netherlands and Belgium, one to New Zealand, and two went to that kingdom of Babylon, otherwise affectionately known as Southern California. I was called to Germany and set apart as a missionary by an apostle and author of that book that we affectionately call The Green Dragon, uh, Mormon Doctrine. I don't know if you've had a discussion about that, Steve. Um, but I was set apart for a mission by Bruce R. McConkie. My mission president was bank president and former head of the Utah State Tax Commission, Orville Gunther. There were some notable missionaries in my mission. Uh, one was Kim B. Clark, uh, who became dean of the Harvard Business School, church commissioner, president of BYU-Idaho. He was in my uh, district in Stuttgart. Um, Jack Welch, scholar and attorney, who discovered the role of chiasmus in the Book of Mormon. Uh, he was in my mission. Um, and I also served in Regensburg. And there were other, David, David A. Bednar, um, was in my mission. I've had numerous conversations and correspondence with Thomas S. Monson. Um, my wife and I were married in the Salt Lake Temple by Ezra Taft Benson. Hmm. I've served in many capacities as executive secretary in a number of bishoprics, priesthood leader and teacher, gospel doctrine teacher, 70s group leader, high priest group leadership, uh, unofficial ward bulletin passer outer. Uh, and as my five daughters will attest, I'm a lousy home teacher. And I'm usually the one to fall asleep after sacrament meeting uh, or after sacrament. And I'm the only one that they know that took his entire Sunday school class, their youth class, to 7 Eleven for donuts and big gulps during Sunday school. <laughs> uh, 
I first read the Book of Mormon when I was 11 because it was a statewide assignment from the president of the East Sharon Stake in Provo. I read from our family's 1888 Book of Mormon. It's a large print leather edition. I'm sure, Robert, you're aware of what yeah. that one is. That's nice. Um, I confess it didn't compare with my favorite book that I had just completed, The, Huck the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Admittedly, I was impressed with the Book of Mormon and understood the simple stories, although I didn't understand it all, and I rushed through most of it to get the assignment done, like rushing through piano practice to hurry to play baseball with friends who impatiently wait outside. The next time I read it was when I was in ninth grade when I attended Book of Mormon Seminary, and I gained a lot more understanding at that time. But the first time I took the Book of Mormon seriously was the year before my mission. I came home late each night from working at the local potato chip factory in Kaysville and devoted uh, a that quiet hour or two without distraction for serious reading and contemplation. That's when the Lord confirmed to my spirit the truth and power of that book. In retrospect, um, it reminds me of what Nibley said one time. I turn to the Bible when I'm in distress. You get comfort from that, from sorrowing and suffering. But the Book of Mormon is like grabbing the hand of God. It's like grabbing the iron rod. You've got something very solid there. It's like a hand reaching down to grab you, and it says we're not lost at all. When I read this new edition of the Book of Mormon, the feelings are even more intense. It offers greater clarity, deeper understanding, and a more powerful spirit. This edition feels like both of his hands reaching down to lift you up. What a tremendous gift he's given our generation. Hmm. Interesting. Well, thank, thank you for sharing this, Paul. I think it's really important to give us the context and the background. And obviously, you, you're you a Book of Mormon guy. And I think that it was really, it's to me, it's very significant. That it was Ezra Taft Benson that Mary, that sealed you guys because he was a Book of Mormon guy. He was, he indeed. was the one that decided that the church needed to refocus on it, that the church had been uh, in error or in out of order for not... Uh, uh, following the Book of Mormon, and really maybe talk about that just a little bit. That that period where he made a real concerted effort to uh, for the church to re-embrace the Book of Mormon. Well, I think Robert could probably speak to that as well. Uh, well, I remember as a little kid, uh, Benson, um, President Benson, kind of did a early 1980s uh, re-emphasis of the Book of Mormon, and uh, he said uh, something to the tunes of. Uh, missionaries uh coming um, memorizing hundreds of passages of the book of mormon um as they you know go on their mission and it was actually a turning point for me on at the mtc saying oh yeah i need to emphasize the book of mormon a little bit more and i remember um, benson was the one that kind of uh pushed it to a general conference saying that we need to kind of re-emphasize the book of mormon as as a standard for us as well so um i i'm a little younger than the um uh he i didn't say human but well, Oh, the general authority, the doctrine, the gospel doctrine. Um, Bruce R. McConkie? McConkie, yeah. I'm a little oh, younger McConkie. than the McConkie generation, but I do remember yeah. you know, Benson um, emphasizing it as well. So, Yeah. And so I, I, I wanted to ask you, Paul, so people are going to ask, okay, so what is this 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 edition of the Book of Mormon? Uh, who's behind this and what, what got you involved in this? Uh well, there are a group who were interested uh, almost a dozen years ago about reclaiming the scriptures and make having the most accurate, most reliable, mo the most trustworthy uh, set of scriptures. So uh, there were a couple of groups who came together and uh, made a conscience, conscientious effort to... Uh, rediscover the the real scriptures, make them available. Uh, and so they set about um, taking each book, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Book of Mormon, and the Doctrine and Covenants, and redoing them in the best possible uh, accurate way. And I think that was 
in seven years seven years ago, uh, those were completed and published, and they're the most. At, for example, the Joseph Smith translation and the uh, the Bible. We we made we we've produced the most accurate version of the Bible, uh, the Joseph Smith translation that has been ever produced, uh, taking all the sources, all the original sources and combining them and going over them word by word. Uh, we did the same with the Book of Mormon and we made the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, we call it now the Teachings and Commandments. Um, we made that chronological, not just um, so one can start at the beginning and go throughout, and it's all chronological. It's, and we've also added back in the uh, lectures on faith, which had been uh, taken out in the 1920s. Yeah, and so yeah. I just want to share with the audience, um, you were kind enough to send me this set uh, last year. And uh, this was this is the, the series, which is really interesting. And so what's, what's also fascinating is that you use you integrate the Joseph Smith translation for both the Old and New Testaments. In this case, the Old and New Covenants, and so you integrate that in there. But also in the New Covenants, it also includes the Book of Mormon with the New Testament. Um, yeah, uh, the, Joseph Smith had a uh, a vision, and he said that um, that he wanted to publish both the New Testament and the Book of Mormon together, and. Uh, that was never done in his lifetime, and we wanted to honor that request, so we uh, we made that happen. Yeah, and and then um, I want to actually share another edition that your group and I've had Adrian on um, to talk about the Stick of Joseph in the hand of Ephraim. Maybe maybe talk a little bit about this unique edition of the Book of Mormon as well. Well, that's a it's um, it's an English Book of Mormon, but it ha has all the Hebraicisms of the uh, of the Stick of Joseph of the original Book of Mormon uh, included. In it appeals to uh, English speaking and reading uh, Jewish audience that uh, that contains all the uh, Hebraicisms. Yeah. Um, and like, oh, the, like Mosiah, Moshiah, or just yeah. you have using using more Hebrew uh, Hebrew sounding names of Book of Mormon people and stuff like that. So it's a really interesting edition of the Book of Mormon. And then I, I, I this is the latest edition, and I, I and maybe explain um, what this is all about because this the, this is your this is your wheelhouse, and I know that you you put a lot of work into this. Just explain to our audience, what is the Covenant of Christ edition of the Book of Mormon? Well, it's the original Book of Mormon was translated to be accepted as scripture by its generation, um, by the, the 19th century generation. Uh, and it, used, it uses language similar to the King James Version. However, this version aims to help a new generation understand its content and prepare for the Lord's return. Um, if you if you look at uh, when you read the regular Book of Mormon, it contains uh, archaic language, um, uh, archaic phrasing, and it tries to emulate the uh, the King James type language, and we the lord wanted to have it updated okay yeah yeah definitely a king james cadence that it's well known in in the in the original edition of the book of mormon and so the, so you so this is kind of revelatory that it was since that the time has come for a modern english edition for a 21st century audience uh, maybe speak to that yeah exactly uh it has in the in the front matter the preface and introduction really give a good summary of um, of the purpose of it, um, the the translation of the text into English by Joseph Smith 
it used an older version of English, often referred to as Elizabethan or Shakespearean, or it came to be known as early modern English. And that was that was in use uh, A.D. 1485 to 1714. So many of the words that were in common usage before the creation of the King James Bible in 1611. So it needed this this new edition uh, needed to be addressed to the people of our day so that youth could read it, uh, young children can read it, it could be translated into other languages more easily, and uh, it make it it gives it clarity that uh, was lost is lost by people who tried to attempt to read the King James Version. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, um, what was interesting is, uh, like, I was reading your introduction, and you know, Stephen, you and I have talked a little bit. We've talked. I've got a handful or a dozen, or I'm not saying a dozen, but a few um, paraphrased Book of Mormons. Um, you know, we were talking about the plain English Book of Mormon, and this is the fun one that I like. Uh, Michael Hicks did a, um, a paraphrase, as he's called it, the street legal version of Mormon's book. And you know, the emphasis, I guess, the vocabulary that we've talked about is a paraphrased Book of Mormon. And um, this Covenant of Christ doesn't claim it as a paraphrase Book of Mormon. It claims it as an updated language Book of Mormon, which they they mentioned that they tried to keep the the message and the sentence structure and the details proper, um, but updated language as compared to um, uh, paraphrasing it. Um, Paul, you want to talk a little bit about like what's the difference for you between paraphrasing and or updating language? Um. And just so you know, I just popped on the screen some of some of this, the modern oh, English good. versions of the Book of Mormon um, that that uh, in this chart here, which I think is just interesting. So, yeah. Well, I th I think our attempt was to clarify uh, clarify the meaning, which is not changing its meaning. I mean, what we try to do is restate the matter in words that are better understood. Um, the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon is in a language, you know, it's foreign It's foreign to modern speech. It separates the reader by the language. Uh, whereas clarifying or restating something to make it more clear uh, is something you would hear said today in modern language. It speaks to a reader today uh, in words used in conversation. When we first began this, um, and it's probably four years ago, at least, uh, the attempt was to bring it into modern language. So we employed a scholar who um, is well-versed in early modern English okay, um, and has a couple of PhDs and has the largest database of English writing, which is searchable. And what we did is we went through every single word of the Book of Mormon, every phrase, um, every idiom, and spent over three and a half years making tens of thousands of corrections and additions and questions. And many of those were resolved by um, looking at the what the original words mean, uh, what they meant in 1500, for example. Um, so it was it was meticulously and assiduously looked at, analyzed, and suggestions were made. And it took us over three years to accomplish that. And then we turned it over to uh, Denver, who reviewed it a, a dozen times and made thousands of changes. So that's how it that's how it initially came out. Yeah, and just yeah, want to make so, sure for the audience, just clear, it was Denver Snuffer for people who aren't that's familiar correct. Um, who, who that's did it. Correct. Robert, you had a question? Yeah, you know, same thing. The introduction said that uh, you know you guys had a linguist that would give alternative uh, like the alternative text or the updated text and then denver would denver snuffer would look at it and then go back to the scriptures is there a committee and i you know that it's called the um 
Restoration Scriptures Foundation, and I guess there's a scripture committee to kind of go through this, but like Denver was the 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 point in terms of it would go to Denver Snuffer and then go back to the scripture committee, then go to the linguist. And I think the linguist did it, you know, first in terms of the general and then you know, back and forth with Denver Snuffer quite a few times. And I think uh, it was a kind of a, a tedious or a labor intensive process to kind of really go through. And I think there were quite a few, um, not say versions, but there were quite a few um, run throughs on this, uh, Paul, for getting it to where it's now. Oh, oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, when you spend three and a half years on a project, uh, there are lots of changes. Uh, thousands, tens of thousands of questions had to be answered. Um, but even before we turned it over to, to Denver, um, and those had, and we got it in the best shape you know, possible. Uh, but then, then once we turned it over, uh, then it was out of our hands temporarily um, and then brought back to us for uh, a, a final review. To Denver Snuffer back and forth. Okay. That's correct. Um, which which means, and um, Stephen, which means that uh, this, the once again, the Restoration Scriptures Foundation is kind of outside of um, a Salt Lake Church umbrella, and it's actually now becoming independent. So um, I was going to say, uh, well, the Paul, Restoration of Scriptures Foundation has always been independent. Yeah. So, Paul, were you involved? This is the first one that came out. Were you involved with all of them? And and tell me about your background around around. around the number of books as well as like, how were you part of all of these, if you will? Uh, I had a, I had a small part in the scripture um, in the initial scripture uh, project. Uh, there were others who, who uh, carried bigger loads. So. Okay. And just the, one thing that's interesting is that you have this done in, you just maybe talk about the versification behind this. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you, you use the, um, the standard versification from, you know, the the Utah-based or the Salt Lake Church, but also uh, you also have it broken down like in paragraphs, so it would be more similar to the original edition. Maybe maybe talk to to that, how that's set Well, up. we wanted to make it easy for people uh, with an LDS background to uh, be able to read it and to find things. Um, so we've included the standard LDS chapter and verse uh which makes it easy, you know, if you're, if you're, if you, if you carried that book around for, you know, uh, for 40 years, like I have, uh, you're familiar with the uh, LDS, you know, uh, versification. The, but we wanted in, in our scripture project that ended in 2017, where we published, we wanted to make, we wanted to be true to, to Joseph Smith's uh, edition. Um, his chaptering, if I can call it, is di was different than the uh, the modern chapter and verse four of the Book of Mormon. For example, his first Nephi chapter one in the eighteen thirty uh, comprises five chapters of the current LDS, and we wanted uh, in the Restoration edition we wanted to make sure that. Uh, um, the versification doesn't chop up um, the uh, the what I want to say. We 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 place it into paragraphs, so verses aren't chopped up. So single thoughts mm -hmm. can be can so be the, to represent the original flow of the document, but you exactly. still want to include the versification there so that people can yeah. use it as a reference, and then they can compare it to their their edition as well. And uh, yeah, I think I think it's very helpful that you did that. So you kind of have like the almost like the original edition interspersed with the the the, the new chapter and verse versification. Um, did you? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm I'm just really curious, and I actually want to go over a couple other things. But um, have you guys looked at is the chiastic structure? that we find in the 1830 edition do we do we, do you do is this do, would, is that still part of this whole thing or is that emphasized there, there that some of that still remains absolutely okay okay and that's interesting and then i actually wanted to do the screen share real quick because i think for my audience who especially 
for those of you who are interested in modern English editions of the Bible, um, we had a friend of ours actually do kind of an analysis of similarity scores. And so the lower the number, the more similar it is. And so if we look, the, and these are actually three very popular editions. So the 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 edition that it most closely is is in similar to is what's called the New International Version. And then you have the HCSB, which is actually put out by the Southern Baptist Convention. And you have the ESV, which is a very popular, the English, um, the ESV version um, of the of the Bible, and so so for those of you who read modern translations of the Bible, this is it, it reads a lot like the New International Version, which is uh, the I was raised with two uh, Bibles, the King James Version and the NIV, and these are also what we call, I think they're be considered dynamic equivalence uh, translations. So it sounds to me kind of the same philosophy was done with this edition of the Book of Mormon, and when they say dynamic dynamic equivalence, it's like trying to take a phrase and try to have it represented or word best represented in our understanding of 21st century um, uh, reader. And so, yeah, it's just, it's just fascinating. So for those of you who are wondering, yeah, it, and then I can tell you, it reads very familiar to me because I grew up with the NIV and it was like, this feels very familiar to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to give you an example, Stephen, uh, like for example, Moroni chapter 10 and uh, everyone knows like, when you read these things, I would exhort you to, you know, ask God the eternal father if these things are not true. And it's the, uh, in this covenant of Christ, it says, uh, I would urge you to ask God the eternal father in the name of Christ, aren't these things true? And if you ask with sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, you know, we kind of hear the same mess, the same as a Salt Lake text, but there's a couple of words uh, that are updated. Um by the power of the Holy Ghost, you can know the truth of all things. So it was interesting. Like, for example, my favorite word is exhort. And like for this oh. Salt Lake word, I, you know, I would exhort you. And as a parent, like I know I exhort my children to do something far more than I urge or encourage my children. And so it's just interesting. Like uh, um, when I when I did my review video on, on Book of Mormon Editions YouTube, it was interesting. Like the conversations was... Uh, is there value on an updated text of the Book of Mormon so that more people can learn it in, and and read it in modern English? Or is there some value to um, do some mental exercise to to really kind of, let's say struggle with it, but to kind of uh, exercise your your mental capacity to have the exhort words and things like that to, to get better meaning rather than just read through it? And I think the answer is it depends on the reader and it depends on like the audience. And so for this one, the audience is a more modern uh, English reader so that they can get um, yeah. more clarity on it. And Robert, have you looked at what the uh, um, reading grade level reading is for the 1830 Book of Mormon? Um, yeah, and it was high school level. And once again, old English. And quite frankly, I have a hard time reading Shakespeare. I don't like the Romeo and Juliet. And like when my daughter had to read a couple of them, it's like, oh, this is hard for me. <laughs> it's because of, yeah, you know, Shakespearean or Elizabethan or like what's called old English. Um, it mattereth not. It's like, oh, my goodness, that's that's tough. It really is tough. And for a modern English Book of Mormon or a modern English you know, language to come out, a book to come out, much more easier to read. And, you know, once again, that's the trade off. And I think I, I'm not as experienced enough to know which one's better, but I do understand that there's um, there's value in in both, I guess. So, yeah. And that's the oh. conundrum because there's certainly value in both. And I don't know. And say what's better, and I don't think that I should know what's better, but it's really interesting that that's the conundrum that people have to evaluate. Do I want to read the Book of Mormon in modern English to do it to do it better, or to do I read the Salt Lake Book of Mormon to do it better? I don't know. So, well, they both have value, no question mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, right. Yeah, and to your point, Stephen, I mean, I have I've got the NIV as well, and really enjoy it. I I think it's a I think it's an awesome translation, and and it's it makes for a modern audience to appreciate the Bible, you know, if they get a chance for it. I also, I don't know if you're familiar with this one, but uh, there's a three volume set. Uh, Robert Alter is set on the Old Testament. Oh, fantastic! Okay, and, uh, yeah, I'm not 
terribly familiar with that particular one. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I wanted you to speak to this October, there's going to be, so basically within, within your group, um, I remember when the big story came out, when you guys kind of came out with a, a new canon of scripture and, and it, it was, uh, it was kind of historically significant. And mm -hmm. so this, this October, there's going to be uh, the possibility of this particular um, addition to be also canonized that maybe speak to that. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, yeah. There's going to be a, a conference in October. Um, and people will have an opportunity to sustain this as scripture, um, along with the uh, the Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Mormon teachings and commandments. So that'll take place at the end of October. Okay, so so are you saying that in addition to this, you're also going to be canonizing other stuff too? No, 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 oh, just that. Just this, okay, because all, the, all that. the rest of it's been canonized, and this will be added. That's correct. To yeah, okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. And, and this will be held, I guess, later next month in Utah. And, in Utah. Uh, yep. Okay. And uh, Robert. which is another important thing because and we either compare a Book of Mormon to Salt Lake or we compare a Book of Mormon to like a third party study edition uh, or like with these paraphrased Book of Mormon uh, copies of the Book of Mormon. Um, I, I really think, you know, Covenant of Christ, uh, modern English Book of Mormon is trying not to do a uh, you know, trying not to merge into paraphrase Book of Mormon. But what's interesting is with with a third party scripture study, it's it's for, if you will, better information, better knowledge, you know, more information so that you can read the Book of Mormon. And it doesn't claim it as anything other than a study scripture. What's interesting is this one is, it, you know, the, the first part, there's a dedicatory prayer to it and then an answer back or a you know a prayer offering it as um requesting it as good enough to the lord and then a prayer back and so this this states it as um more than just a uh a good version or more than just a helpful version it now becomes canon for you and it now becomes um um let's say authorized but it's 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 a canonized scripture as compared to just a um, good faith work, if you will. Exactly. Yeah. And it's and it's kind of has a divine approval on it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. The I we consider that the Lord took ownership of the of the book and authorized it and wants it to be published. Uh, he's very he's very clear about that. Well, I want you to do me a favor and make sure you send me links that I can put in the description for this video. So people who are interested in acquiring these scriptures um, will we'll have those links available to the audience. And Robert, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah. And so what's interesting is, and Paul, maybe you can kind of discuss more about it, but um, in, on Denver Snuffer's website, uh, the the voting words is, pro, is made public and it says, do you have faith in these things? And receive scriptures approved by the Lord. Scriptures approved by Lord as standard to govern your your daily life and uh, walk in life. To accept the obligations established by the covenant of Christ as a covenant, and to use the scriptures cr to correct yourselves and guide your words and thoughts and deeds. It's really interesting. Um, you know, the back and forth that I I have on this is that it's kind of interesting that there's a, a vote to say, well, do we approve the the covenant of Christ? But the wording from an outsider is also like this is also already established as um, a revelatory book. Now, are you going to follow it? So it's interesting. Like, have you has there been discussion around the vote as well as like the meaning of the vote for um, canonizing this and or um, voting to follow it, if you will? Well, I'm I'm sure there has been discussion. I I haven't been privy to too many discussions other than. Uh, it the wording is similar to the covenant uh, wording that was given in 2017. Okay. Um, to accept the scriptures and to uh, follow the covenant that the Lord provided. Yeah. So it's it's similar. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, and once again, the emphasis is is it's not just a, uh, a helpful guide. It's now. Um, it's now canon and um 
uh, approved by the Lord. Uh, so really interesting. And then once again, by way of Denver Snuffer and um, the group for it. So I'm I'm really excited, Stephen. It's kind of interesting kind of seeing a modern English version of the Book of Mormon. Um, you'll have, what's interesting is that Anytime I do a, a video, uh, the video of the this one, the stick of Joseph, you know, the others from the Restoration Scriptures Foundation, there's a lot more views on those. And it's uh, real interesting seeing uh, the views on it. And uh, you either have, oh, this is awesome, or oh, it's um, from Denver Snuffer's uh, influence. So it's kind of interesting, like you have conversation. And the conversation is always good because it's... it's um, it adds to the content, but it's real interesting that you have now a a volume that's tied to um, Denver Snuffer's influence because it rests on on what he did and the answer he got back as well. So yeah, good point. Uh, I think this. I think the book is completely solid enough uh, on its own to stand on it on its own. Um, you know, I think if people are willing to walk away from something of value, then that's their loss. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd really like to see LDS doc, LDS gospel doctrine classes and seminary classes use the text. Um, I think it's inevitable that it'll be welcomed by many, many people. Um, whether whether you like it or you don't, like where it came from or don't, uh, I think it's going to stand on its own and it will survive uh, whatever gets thrown at it. Um, yeah, I mean, we're seeing we're seeing we're seeing a move towards uh, modern translations of the New Testament from an LDS perspective. Thomas Wayman's been on my program to talk about his edition of the New Testament, and from my understanding, it is being used on the ward level. So maybe yeah. we see a similar thing happening with the Covenant of Christ. Well, I I mean, what I like about it is the Covenant of Christ has a spirit, and that spirit is Christ, and I think it's a far better text than any other in conveying the spirit of Christ. Uh, I think uh, Joseph said that a man can get closer to God by abiding its pre- precepts than any other book. You know, a- heaven and angels don't show up for insignificant tasks, like bringing books for casual reading, especially to disinterested people. Uh, the book's contents have been clarified. Uh, the themes were selected with great care. Um, it's become an indispensable textbook for the beginner who's interested in religion, and as well as for those uh, who want to deepen their understanding of uh, of their religion. Uh, it teaches a person how to connect with God, and in the eternal sense, how to reconnect with him. Well, I want to implore you or somebody, Denver, to uh, my good friend, Dr. Christopher Thomas, just recently stepped down as the president of the Book of Mormon Studies Association, of course, is best known for his book, A Pentecostal Reads the Book of Mormon, a literary and theological introduction. I would think it would be great if you guys were to give a presentation to that organization. Now, of course, next that they're doing it next month, uh, so it would be too late for this year. But maybe next year, I would really encourage, because I think scholars would be really interested in uh, the, the, the this approach that's taken to the, the Book of Mormon as well. And I can definitely get you hooked up with that too, Paul, if you guys are interested. Okay. I think okay. that'd be great, a great contribution. Of course, Robert, you gave a presentation there last year. I did. Uh, Book of Mormon Census uh, was just started last year and they uh, gave me honor to uh, give me some space to uh, do a presentation on it. Um, going up, I think there's their their conference is the middle of October mm-hmm. and it is in Logan area. Yep. Um, and I think I'm going up this year as well. So I'm not presenting this time, but it's going to be uh, good to good to go anyway. So yeah, it's it's I I've, I've been meaning to get out to one of those because my good and I wish Christopher would well Christopher will be there. He just won't be the, as far as I know he'll be there. He just is no longer the president, but good friend of mine and really appreciate. And actually, um, I think that Denver Snuffer <clears throat> is truly one of the most fascinating people that I've met in this journey in the restoration. I find I personally uh, enjoy his company. I think he's, uh, and I, I moderated his thing last year at Sunstone. And I think that it's a movement within the restoration that people need to pay attention to. Um, it's not going anywhere. And it's certainly having an impact even on the local level. I've, I've heard from people in my local ward who've watched my interview with Denver. So it is having, um, he's having starting interesting conversations within the restoration. And Paul, I'm just curious, uh, what, what, how long have you been involved in, in this movement? Um. I met, uh, I've known Denver ever since the publication of his first book, 
uh, the second comforter uh, conversing with the Lord through the veil. Um, I think since since his conversion to the church over 50 years ago, I, you know, speaking for myself, uh, it wouldn't be hyperbole to say that he explains the doctrine of Christ and the gospel more clearly than anyone of my generation. Um, I think perhaps more effectively than a McConkie, Talmadge, Widso, um, and without diminishing anybody else's contributions, um, uh, it, certainly better than anyone today. So I, I am. I do want to have one last question here, and that is, um, you know, a lot of do you, <clears throat> do you guys anticipate a commentary on this as well? Like, do you think Denver will do an actual commentary? on this particular edition, I think that would be a fascinating work for him to do. And it doesn't necessarily have to be canonized or anything. It'd just be a, you know, a, a lay, you know, an individual doing a commentary on it. Is that something that's been discussed? He uh, started to on his website. On um, his website. Yeah. yeah. I think there've been uh, 12, 13 or 14 uh, blog posts in the recent month, in the last month. Okay. Uh, commentary. I'm not sure. Um, as I said before, I, this book stands on its own. I think that's what the Lord wants. Great. Well, Robert, any any more questions or comments before we wrap this up? Oh, just interesting stuff. Uh, you know, and the the idea behind it is: can a um, volume, um, can a volume of the Book of Mormon um, lead people and draw have people kind of draw closer? Um, in a different format than Salt Lake. And, you know, obviously we've talked a lot about it, that the, the Book of Mormon, you know, Salt Lake does not have a monopoly on the Book of Mormon. Um, but I think uh, how you do something is as important as what you do. And so it's always interesting. And I think that's up to the reader and the to evaluate, like, how can I best learn uh, of the, the words of the Book of Mormon and go from there? So, you know, fascinating um, and very interesting how this is... Uh, how this is coming forth as well as uh, it gives different options and opportunities for readers of the book Warren. Yeah, I think, um, uh, I remember one quote from a, a book, I think it's the book, a prayer for Owen Meany. You know, the character says, uh, you've been given a clue. God has given you a clue. Now you have a choice. Either you use, use God's gift or you waste it. I think a little effort from you is required. Mm -hmm. I think when people, when you read the covenant of Christ, it's possible that every word, every phrase, every sentence becomes a proposition for discovery. Much different than the 1830 version. They all present a number of possibilities. And I think it's up to you and me to find out what it contains. Um, I think there are a lot of hidden treasures that... Uh, when I've discussed this book with other people, they say, oh, I didn't realize this. Or, oh, that, it, that opens up that completely different than what, I, what I've been reading for the last 20 years. Um, my suggestion is for everyone to take this astonishing revelation and warning, <laughs> seriously. It's a stunning translation. And it shouldn't be neglected. I, th I, I, it's a heavenly gift, and it's an offer that was made directly from God to okay. us. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for coming on to share this work with the audience. Again, we'll have links uh, in the description uh, for those of you who are interested in this edition of the Book of Mormon. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments as well from those of you who maybe already have a copy of this edition. What are your thoughts about it? Um, has it been really a, a good thing in your life? Do you feel like the Lord is speaking to you in these in these pages? I'd be really curious to see what people have to say about it. I'd like to hear from people from all the different branches of the Restoration as what their thoughts are on this as well, because, again, we talk to everybody. Um, Paul, I want to thank you so much for coming on the program today. Well, thank you for the invitation, yeah. and uh, I hope it's been helpful. Uh, it's been illuminating for me to listen to you too as well. Well, thank you, Paul and Robert. Always a pleasure having you on. You always bring something to, 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 to the table. So I think I'll have you back even at least one more time. What do you think? Well, thank you again. I, I hope I've done a good, good, uh, good time. So thank you so much.
All right. Well, check out Robert's channel, Book of Mormon Editions on YouTube as well. We're going to have links in the description to everything. Plus, for those of you who'd like to financially support the channel, we have links to Patreon, Venmo, and PayPal, as well as our merch store, mormonbookreviews.com, where you can get lovely things such as this cap. I think they're sold out, but I'll have to double check to see if there's some in the inventory. But we do appreciate those of you who do <clears throat> financially support <clears throat> the channel. And remember, the most important thing is this. All the voices of the Restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.